My name is Kara Maciel, and I am from the law firm of Khan Maciel Carey. We, I'm joined with my partner, Andrew Summer, and Andrew is our partner in our uh, California office. He heads our California office, and we're talking today about how to address access issues for places of public accommodation as you provide goods and services to guests um, and other individuals with disabilities. Here's the agenda we're going to cover today. Uh, we're going to go over some of the ADA access standards scope as well as some obligations. Andrew's going to cover the California state access standards. We're going to address some areas of your property um, or place that you might find would be an area of vulnerability for litigation, and then implementing proactive steps to, um, to avoid costly liability in litigation. The reason that Andrew and I focus so much of our practice on this is because disability access litigation continues to increase dramatically. In fact, last year, there was a huge surge in Title III lawsuits by more than 63% nationally, uh, with a total of 4,400 federal lawsuits. California is the largest, and you can see here over 3,000 lawsuits and demand letters um, in California uh, were, were filed between September 2012 and December 2013. Florida uh, is close in second with uh, 2,000 cases filed last year as well as New York is, is very popular. But we get these cases um, all around the country, um, and we litigate them all around under the federal law, um, as well as you know, coupling it with the state law ac uh, access codes as well. So what is the Americans with Disabilities Act? You know, a lot of people, a lot of clients call me and say, you know, Carrie, I don't really need to worry about this law because you know, I, I put that burden on my architects and my contractors and the construction crew when I build a property or when I you know, do some new construction or alterations to the property. And they're the ones who really is responsible for making sure that our properties are compliant with the ADA. And unfortunately, that's not true. I mean, the ADA and Title III in particular is much broader than that. I mean, it is an expansive civil rights law that goes beyond just your brick and mortar structures, but also you know, addresses policies and procedures that you need to implement to ensure that your guests and patrons with disabilities have an equal opportunity to use the services provided by your store or your property. Um, and importantly, the ADA provides for joint and several liability. So a lot of owners think, well, I just own the structure. I don't have any control over what happens inside of it. So that's really the responsibility of the operator. And the reality is, is that there is joint liability and you may want to consider addressing the allocation of responsibility for liability in a management agreement or a lease agreement or some other contractual obligation that indemnifies certain provision people or identifies who's responsible for defense costs or who might be responsible for re remediation of issues that might be mandated by a lawsuit. But, but be aware that either individual, either party, can be, can be held liable and named in a lawsuit. This year marks the 25th anniversary of the ADA, and so we expect to see some new regulations coming out from the Department of Justice um, and other, you know, other issues highlighting you know, the 25th anniversary. So the Title III, you know, essentially what it obligates you to do is you can't use any kind of eligibility criteria to screen out an individual with a disability. You need to modify any of your policies and procedures and practices so that you can have access and they can enjoy the goods and services of your product, unless doing so would somehow alter the good and service that you provide. It requires auxiliary aids and services for effective communication. If you've got someone who's, who's hearing impaired, um, you might need to provide some kind of TTY device if, if you have a phone conversation or if you have a visually impaired guest. You need to be able to you know, provide some kind of auxiliary aid for, for a transaction that might be necessary. And then the, the removal to uh, barriers to access. Um, that's, the, you know, that's the structural issues that we, a lot of people have talked about and we'll, we'll cover a little bit today. So if you have an existing facility that was constructed before January 26, 1992, 
then you only are obligated to remove barriers if it is readily achievable to do so and doesn't require much difficulty or expense. The term readily achievable really turns on a lot of factors, and there's no one size fits all for every single property. Um, it, you, know, you think about the cost to remove the barrier, the size of the business, and the business's financial resources. So what might, be okay, you know, what might be okay for a very large chain that has properties around the country and you know, has high significant revenue, it might be readily achievable to remove a particular barrier for that individual and that property, but it might not be for a smaller kind of mom and pop shop down the street that has much smaller margins and much less profit. So it really is a very fact-specific case-by-case -case analysis of what is readily achievable and what is not. Um, where removal of the barrier is readily achievable, it's not a violation of the law if disabled persons are provided with effective access uh, to the goods and services that are provided. For any constructions or alterations after January 1992, then you need to make sure that those, are, those buildings are being built and constructed in compliance with either the 1991 ADAG standards or the 2010 ADAG, ADA standards. Um, originally, the ADA standards were published in 1991, um, but they were later supplemented to address other issues and ultimately were amended uh, in 2010 and became effective on March 15, 2012. So depending on when alterations took place, there's different standards that apply, um, and it's just important to understand and know which ones cover your particular issue. There is a safe harbor in the 2010 standards. If you've got a building, if you've got an element that already complies with the 1991 ADAG standard, um, you don't need to, and there's a new element in the 2010 standards that would change that feature, you don't need to immediately correct it until you do some kind of renovation or some other type of alteration to the building. So what is an alteration to a building within the ADA? Um, it's it's mod any kind of modification that affects its usability. Um, we're not talking about you know, a soft goods renovation, but we're talking about remodeling, uh, restriping, re you know, changes to structural issues within the property, electrical issues. You know, mere painting, uh, you know, paint, new paint probably isn't going to do it. But if you need to pull a permit and you're doing some construction and moving walls, moving electrical elements, things of that nature, that likely is considered an alteration under the ADA. And when you do that alteration, you need to make sure that those altered areas are now in compliance with the most recent 80, 2010 ADA standards. You can be relieved of a modification requirement if there's unreasonable hardship based on things like the cost of providing access, cost of construction, um, or the nature of accessibility that would either be gained um, or lost. You've got in litigation, you have a couple of defenses to barrier removal, uh, depending on you know, the individual and who's challenging it. Um, you know, some, they might not have standing. Someone who is mobility impaired and in a wheelchair would not have standing to challenge the braille signage, for example, around the property. Um, so things of that nature. Construction tolerances. If you've, if you've made a, 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 an area that is, you know, only a, a few percentage points or very slightly altered from what the standards require, we can argue construction tolerances. If you have alternative designs and technologies that provide substantially equivalent or greater access, we can say that, that, that there's equal facilitation. And then finally, you know, structural impracticability, if it's just not practical based on what your property looks like, if you can't move a wall, if you can't widen a door a certain way because of the structure of your property, um, that's another defense. But the reason that these cases are so prevalent and so popular um, and really becoming a cottage, cottage niche industry by a lot of professional plaintiffs is because they can get a recovery of attorney's fees. Um, and not damages under the federal law, but they can get costs. Some states do provide for certain statutory damages like California that Andrew will talk about. But 
you know, they think that they can come in, get a very quick settlement, and you know, do a little, you know, a little bit of work for a lot of payday. And so that's why these cases are so important because it primarily is injunctive relief, changes to policies and practices, but it largely is driven by attorney's fees. So I'm going to cover a couple of the common violations that result in litigation. And the most popular one are your parking lots. This does not require anyone to actually come onto your property or walk around inside your facility or store um, or hotel um, or because all they have to do is really drive around and see if you have accessible parking. If you don't, that will be a clue to them that maybe there are other areas within your property that are not accessible and as a result um, opens the door to a broader, a broader lawsuit. So just generally, you should know that you need to provide accessible parking spaces for vans. Uh, one out of every space, accessible spaces has to be van accessible. And, um, and an accessible parking space has to have an access aisle allowing a wheelchair to get in and get out of the vehicle. Andrew, what else do you want to say about the parking lots and the other uh, issues? Okay, a very significant issue with uh, the parking lots is uh, ensuring that there's an access aisle that does not require travel behind any other vehicle. And that's a very significant issue. There's safety concerns related to someone in a wheelchair having to pass behind another vehicle. And given that uh, there, this is one of the major uh, items that results in access litigation, uh, since anyone just driving by literally your property can see the parking lot and see whether there's a violation, determine whether they actually want to go in and find more violations. That's really important to have a, a uh, diligent survey of the parking lot area. And so there's a number of concerns that Kara already uh, mentioned, uh, different requirements. There is the there, well, there's striping, there's the need for an access aisle if there's two accessible spots side by side, there needs to be an access aisle of a specific width in between the two. Uh, there needs to be a, uh, a appropriate signage by the International um, uh, Department of Accessibility or essentially uh, uh, an uh, internationally adop adopted standard. Uh, there also uh, needs to be, f uh, for every six ac accessible parking spaces, a van accessible spot, and that van accessible spot will have different requirements for the uh, format for the dimensions of that spot. Uh, and uh, it's important to note, too, that there is a requirement that there be a, uh, an accessible uh, route that basically the shortest accessible uh, distance from the parking spot to the building that it serves or the, the site that it serves so that typically you'll see these accessible spots close in distance to the actual building. Uh, now, now turning to the, uh, the next slide, uh, this is the uh, actual breakdown under the AD, ADA of the allocation of spots. So if you, if you have one to 25 parking spots altogether, you're required to have one accessible parking space, and then it's an additional uh, parking uh, space if you're up to 50 spots and so on and so on for increments of 25 spots. Once you get up to 501 spots, then it's a percentage of the total number. When you're up to 1,001 spots, you're, you're looking at a set allocation of 20 accessible spots plus one for every 100 additional spots or any fraction thereof. So one thing I, I did want to point out is uh, when we've had discussions with clients before about what are the top access uh, violations that result in litigation, typically it's parking lots, it's passive travel. We see that over and over again in litigation. And there was a uh, study done by the uh, California Commission on Disability Access, and they have begun in response to a recent new law accumulating data on demand letters and complaints. And in that, they identified a top 10 list. And it really includes what we already had in mind, which was parking, various different aspects of parking, ramps and passive travel, and restrooms. And those were the items, uh, interestingly, that we already uh, were considering uh, reviewing in the webinar. And, um, and so the second issue uh, that frequently comes up is an accessible route. And that affects 
uh, essentially every public accommodation, whether you be a grocery store, whether you be a medical facility, whether you be a hotel. And so you are required to have an accessible route uh, that's at least three feet wide, and that has to go throughout the property to every uh, publicly accessible area. Uh, you are not required to have more than one accessible route to a given location. So where there's, for example, two different routes, one of them must be accessible. And if that is, if that is the accessible route and, and, and uh, you're deciding between one over the other, it's important to provide appropriate directional signage directing uh, disabled guests to that route. Uh, and in a uh, establishment where you have fixed um, items, uh, it's fairly straightforward. You design uh, the space so that you have this accessible route throughout. But what also often happens is, and this can be in a hotel where you have furniture that can be moved, or it can be in a, in a, in a um, retail establishment. It can be a department store where you have clothing racks. What can invariably happen is items can be moved around so you no longer have uh, that, that clear accessible route. Uh, there is, in, under those circumstances, um, a need to have some sort of policy or practice to ensure uh, that there is a accessible path that's maintained throughout. Uh, there is an exception that where there are temporary interruptions for maintenance or repairs, uh, there, there can be relief from the successful path, but that's very restricted in terms of requiring that there be staff available to assist and that this be for a relatively brief period of time. Uh, and again, the successful route needs to be throughout, including uh, through restrooms to toilet stalls, uh, to uh, counters uh, uh, at a lobby of a hotel, or, or checkout counters for a grocery store. Uh, another very significant uh, access item that comes up all the time in litigation is the restrooms. And this I see as one of the more significant issues because if you have a guest that cannot use the restroom because of access issues, uh, you're more likely to have a, uh, at least in California where damages are available, a significant or much more significant demand uh, for damages. And there are cases where, and mostly mom and pop establishments, where someone in a wheelchair simply just can't even get into the restroom. And, and they make a, a claim of emotional distress damages in California where those damages are available. So it's important for restrooms. There's a number of requirements. I, I will try not to go into too much detail, but that there's a, a requirement to have clearance um, at the entry uh, uh, when the guest comes in. You have to have the, the three-foot path of travel throughout. Uh, and then it's important to have a toilet stall that's accessible with the appropriate signage. Um, uh, under the disability standards, and that the, the toilet stall must be a minimum of 60 inches wide, 56 inches in length, and the toilet uh, must be at a center line of se 17 to 18 inches from the sidewall, and the toilet seat must be at a height of 17 to 19 inches. This is a couple inches higher than the typical toilet, and the, this is a very significant issue, the toilet seat height, because uh, individuals in wheelchairs do need to transfer from the uh, wheelchair to the toilet, and that can be a challenging uh, task. And if you have a toilet that's too low, that can be a cause of uh, the individual falling and can be an injury. And we have seen over the years uh, uh, a number of uh, personal injury cases uh, involving transfer issues um, where the toilet was simply too low. Uh, and then there also has to be grab bars on the side walls and uh, rear walls. It's, it's quite frequent that these grab bars are not positioned at the right uh, dimensions. The, the code is very specific for how high, how wide the grab bars need to be. And if a grab bar is, is, is off that measurement, it can make it more difficult for the individual to transfer uh, to the toilet. Uh, the, the lavatory also must be compliant in a number of regards, specifically with uh, knee, knee clearance. Uh, another uh, significant issue that affects many uh, accommodations, or essentially all, is uh, surface heights. And in a uh, 
sales uh, service counter. I mean, that can be at a uh, at a department store. It can be at a, a hotel. There must be a counter surface with that's a minimum of 30 inches long and maximum of 36 inches high. Uh, and the requirements for checkout aisles, which are listed down below, those are slightly different. In, in that case, and that would be, for example, the, the checkout aisle for a grocery store, uh, the counter surface would have to be um, a maximum of 38 inches above the finished floor. And if there's a lip on the aisle side, it cannot exceed 2 inches, which would be a maximum of 40 inches high altogether. Uh, there's also a a frequent issue that comes up is with uh, dining areas. Uh, the tops of, of dining surfaces must be uh, between 28 and 34 inches above the finished floor. There is a requirement for dining areas that 5% of the seating in the, in the functional area uh, be accessible. And that's really a term of art about what the functional area is. And of course, as uh, defense attorneys representing the properties, we argue that that's the full dining area and that we can allocate that, that seating in any of the given areas within it. Uh, there is also a requirement for where there's bar, bar counter seating and there's a portion that's elevated. Uh, there is a requirement to create a lowered section at least 60 inches long and no higher than 34 inches high uh, so that there's accessible seating there. Now I'm going to turn it over to Kara to discuss emerging access standards. Thanks, Andrew. So there are a number of other issues that are starting to become more prevalent in litigation in addition to a lot of the structural issues that we've covered um, and elsewhere. And one of them I want to focus on is website accessibility. Um, currently, there is a big tension in the federal courts across the country as to whether Title VII even applies to websites and whether websites have to be made accessible for individuals with disabilities, primarily someone who is um, you know, visually impaired, that they can use their screen reader access software to navigate the rest of your website and log on and book a hotel room or Buy, a, buy services or see you know, current advertising going on on your website, whatever you do on your website, that they can use that in the same way that a sighted person. Some courts say that places of a public accommodation are limited really to brick and mortar physical structures and not to websites. So if you only have a website, a web-based company, and you're still providing goods and services, you're not considered a place of public accommodation. These cases are coming out like Netflix, um, that kind of organization where they don't have a store, but then they do, but they do have provide goods and services. Other courts have had a really expansive reading and apply Title III standards to websites, and we're starting to see really an increased attention from the Department of Justice and other advocacy groups, primarily um, National Federation of the Blind, to push for these issues and really w establish firm guidelines and regulations on website content accessibility. You know, what, what I'm advising our clients to do is if you do have a website which you hold out and advertise your, your company's products and services, um, it's really important that you make sure that website is, is accessible. Um, there is you know, the accessible, accessibility guidelines, it's WCAG 2.0. That's the dominant website accessibility guideline in place, and we expect the Department of Justice will likely issue rulemaking this summer um, and probably adopting those as well. So if you do have a website, really important to review whether that content can be accessed by someone uh, with visual impairment. The other really developing area of the law are point of sale devices. And this is increasingly common in all kinds of retailers. This is whether you are a grocery store and you check out and have, uh, allow someone to use a point of sale device for a you know, debit or check, um, check card. The same thing if you're a hotel and you start to have a kiosk that allows people to check into their room rather than coming into the front desk. Or your parking garage and you allow people to pay their, their tickets you know, using a kiosk at airports or in the garages. Um, you know, tickets, if you, you know, sell tickets anywhere. There's no specific requirement right now under the 2010 ADE standards that addresses point-of-sale devices, 
But the National Federation of the Blind and others are really pushing this issue on the idea that touchscreens deny the blind patrons full and equal enjoyment because they force patrons to take additional steps to disclose their private consumer information in order to complete the transaction. And they shouldn't have to either rely on someone else or have to verbally say what their private security information is when a sighted person does not. And so this is um, a moving area. We'll see how the courts uh, fall down on those issues. Uh, I will tell you that the Department of Justice is siding with the plaintiffs in these cases and filing briefs. And so to the extent, again, you have a point of sale device or use touch screens within your, within your properties and stores um, to conduct services, something to be aware of for individuals with visual impairment. Another growing area are, you know, are medical facilities and equipment. Um, the Department of Justice you know, has set out some regulations with respect to height um, of exam tables and patient lifts and really ideally individuals with mobility uh, impairments. Um, and there's some good guidance from them. But we are expecting that while your, you know, your, your rooms have to be accessible, right now the, the, the treatment and exam tables per se don't necessarily absolutely have to be accessible. And there are some proposed guidelines out there, and we think that they will be forthcoming very soon because there's been a lot of pressure on um, the Department of Justice and the Access Board that creates these regulations to be much more sensitive in the medical community for individuals with disabilities, particularly with the issues of obesity. And so we've handled cases on behalf of you know, dentists and dental companies and whether the dentist chair has to be um, movable in order for an individual with um, mobility impairment to be able to transfer on and off of, of that chair, which is usually fixed in the, uh, in the floor. Same thing for um, you know, optometrists and people who, who give eye, you know, eye exams and the accessibility of the eye exam equipment. So we do expect things to be more forthcoming, although there is already some guidance out there. Another thing that came, became new with the Department 2010 standards is that recreational facilities now need to be accessible. So if you are in the hospitality industry and you have golf facilities, be aware that you know, all of your golf areas need to be accessible, particularly with paths of travel, um, allowing a wheelchair to be able to be onto the greens and the other fairways, the tee boxes. You want to make sure your public bathrooms and clubhouses are accessible. If you've got a kids club or other play area um, in, on your facility and property, that needs to be accessible. Same thing with boat, docks, and launches. And if you have a fitness club or fitness room uh, on your property, the exercise equipment, there needs to be a path of travel and other accessible features within that fitness room. There's been a lot of discussion about the new laws with respect to swimming pools and in particular the pool lifts that have to be in place. Um, what the Department of Justice has said is that there needs to be at least an accessible means of entry um, on all pools, and to the extent that there are larger pools, you need to have two means of entry or exit, and one of them needs to be either a sloped entry or a pool lift in a fixed location. Um, right now, the Department of Justice and uh, the law itself does not allow a pool lift to be on wheels. Um, because it's considered not fixed. And so, uh, again, a lot of discussion when these laws came out about that requirement, but as of right now in 2015, to the extent that you have a pool lift, you need to make sure that it is, it is, um, it is fixed into the ground. So my favorite topic, before I turn it over to Andrew to close with the California law and what to do with respect to uh, responding to a lawsuit, are service animals. I continue to get questions about this uh, pretty frequently um, with respect to properties that inter encounter service animals, whether it's a hotel or whether it's a restaurant. Um, even Uber right now in California is facing a lawsuit in California, again, um, from the National Federation of the Blind, is suing Uber because Uber allegedly is not allowing service animals in their cars um, by Uber guests. So, you're still seeing questions arising service animals. And it's important to know that a service animal is a dog. Um, it's a dog that is, performed to, that is required to perform work for the person and to the benefit 
uh, of an individual with a disability. I, there is an exception. Um, it can be a, ho a miniature horse, and I've got a good picture on the next slide. But just know that that an animal should be allowed in. It's not considered a pet. Um, and you can't impose any type of fees or additional charges for the service animal. And to the extent that you're not sure and you're not clear whether that, that animal really is a service animal, you can have your staff ask if the animal is required because of a disability or what work or task the animal has been trained to perform. Any other questions beyond that um, really is, is intrusive into the disability and, and really recommend not asking anything else. Um, know, though, that service dogs, service support animals, emotional comfort animals, um, even dogs, are not considered a service animal under the law. It really needs to be an animal that is trained uh, to perform work. And so it really gets into a gray area when you're approached with a, a customer like that as to whether someone really does, is it really a support animal or is it a, a, because of a disability? So as I mentioned, miniature horses um, are also one, although that's, that's uh, the rare exception. You can't require proof. Um, I, I hear a lot, of, um, a lot of questions about this. Well, can I ask for them to have some kind of vest on, or do they have to bring documentation that certified them as a, as a service animal? Under federal law, you do not have to do that. You, you cannot require it. And so even if a state may require a service animal to be quote unquote licensed or certified, um, you, as under the federal law, um, you cannot require proof in order to allow that animal into your property. They do need to be harnessed and under control, and if they are not under control, you do have the ability to exclude the animal, although not the individual. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Andrew to focus on the unique issues of California. All right, thank you, Kara. California definitely is unique in that uh, it has created its own uh, regulatory scheme essentially for access litigation, and that's been to the great uh, consternation of businesses, that, in particular those that operate nationwide. Uh, I'm going to uh, first off address the different uh, laws that are in effect uh, that impact this area in California. There's essentially uh, two uh, main laws. There's the California UNRRA Civil Rights Act, and there's also the Disabled Persons Act. The California UNRRA uh, Civil Rights Act, that uh, essentially prohibits uh, discrimination by business establishments based on various categories, and that includes sex and uh, other characteristics, but one of the protected characteristics is disability. It's a very uh, overarching, more generic uh, uh, piece of, of, of legislation. The Disabled Persons Act, uh, however, is specifically tailored uh, to providing full and equal access and public accommodations to uh, persons with disabilities. Uh, in terms of what a public accommodation is, it's construed very broadly in California as to any business that provides services, goods, or accommodations to the public. So it can include a grocery store, a medical facility, a hotel, a restaurant, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, California uh, does have, um, it would essentially be the equivalent of, of the ADAG, which we have under the federal law, which is the uh, standards uh, or, uh, that apply uh, for specific architectural features uh, in construction. In California, their equivalent is uh, Title 24 of the California Building Code. Uh, Title 24 was in many ways inconsistent with the federal standards, which created uh, a real dilemma for properties in California in terms of how to comply. Uh, in 2013, there were amendments that were designed to uh, avoid or resolve inconsistencies between Title 24 and the federal law, and this was after the enactment of the 2010 federal standards. Now, special considerations for California. So if you're a nationwide business and you have uh, locations in California, uh, specifically what, what you need to keep in mind is that California standards trump the ADA standards uh, where they ensure greater access to disabled persons. Uh, so if there are two competing standards with the federal and the California, you look at which one is more uh, protective of disabled persons, which is 
not always an easy feat, but fortunately there's fewer inconsistencies now. Uh, California is different also in that it does not apply to existing facilities. It only applies to building new construction or alterations to existing facilities. However, the California law or the California standards date back to 1970. So if you have any uh, uh, construction uh, from 1970 onward, oh, I guess construction or alteration, then you'd be looking at the California standards and compliance. Uh, another significant difference is that under California law, uh, there is a requirement that if you are asserting an unnecessary hardship or equivalent facilitation defense to uh, remediating the access item, uh, you must show that you've submitted a hardship application to the appropriate uh, public entity. Uh, which is typically the local uh, building official. And what you would do is submit this application. Uh, and this, these applications are rarely uh, granted. Uh, and, but if there is an issue such as structural infeasibility, uh, if there is a, uh, a terrain issue where you have excessive slopes, you're on a hillside, and there's certain work that just can't be done, uh, it's highly advisable that there be a uh, application submitted to the building officer with the, with the hardship waiver. Uh, most uh, properties do not do that, and that's very important in California uh, if you want to assert those defenses. Uh, the other very significant difference in California, and this is largely responsible for why there's so much access litigation uh, in California, is the, the damages uh, part of it. And under the federal law, there, there's injunctive relief uh, essentially a, uh, a demand that the required work be done in attorney's fees. Both are available under California law. However, additionally, a, 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 a plaintiff can recover $4,000 in statutory damages uh, between one, it's either one or $4,000 depending on the access law at issue. Or, and this is very significant, or they can seek actual damages, so it can be much higher. Uh, where you see uh, statutory damages asserted is when there's repeat visits and they're, they're, they're seeking to stack all of these uh, statutory damages on top of one another. Uh, the California law was changed in recent years to place some sort of standard uh, on the plaintiff before seeking to recover damages. And what the plaintiff needs to do, he or she needs to establish that uh, she experienced Difficulty, discomfort, or embarrassment as a result of personally encountering the violation. So it just can't be some violation. It has to be something that actually that person essentially ran into. Uh, and the, the plaintiff can also recover damages if he or she was deterred from even accessing the public accommodation. So if, if that individual couldn't even get into the door because of the lack of a path of travel. Uh, another very significant aspect of California law is the availability of treble damages up to three times the actual damages. That can be very significant. Um, one point that I need to make is that under California law, if there's a physical injury, a personal injury, uh, that individual could sue under the California access laws and as a result recover attorney's fees and treble damages. So if you have someone that had a, if it was a slip and fall type arrangement but they claim it was because of an access violation, they can recover their attorney's fees now, which typically are not available in a, in a common law action, and they can seek treble damages of, damages of three times their actual damages. So it would become a much more costly, significant lit litigation as a result. Uh, however, to recover treble damages, there needs to be a showing of willful conduct. Uh, and it's, the standard hasn't been fully fleshed out, but it would suggest that if the property is already on notice from past litigation or information they've received, uh, that could be used to prove uh, treble damages. Uh, there have been uh, measures taken to, uh, to curb the, the amount of, of access litigation and, and the abuse. Uh, however, it was really a piecemeal effort that did not have the intended uh, consequence for businesses. And, but there are several aspects of it that I'm going to address. One is that it, uh, there is a reduction in the statutory damages under very specific circumstances. 
Uh, first, if a uh, property has received a, uh, an inspection by a certified access specialist, that's called a CASP, uh, that, uh, that inspection, uh, if they have a copy of the inspection and there hasn't been any alteration of the, of the area since then, they can use that inspection as a basis to seek 60-day delay after receipt of the complaint in the lawsuit to fix the condition and they can seek a reduction of the statutory damages from $4,000 to $1,000. Uh, also, if it's a small business with 25 or fewer employees, uh, even if they haven't had a, a CAST inspection, uh, they will have 30 days to fix a violation after receipt of the complaint before anything can occur, and there's a reduction from $4,000 to $2,000 in statutory damages. The business also must have gross receipts of less than $3.5 million. Uh, and another significant change is that in state litigation, um, if it's a qualified defendant, meaning a defendant that's a uh, small business or has had this cast inspection, they may seek to postpone the state court proceedings to, to pursue some sort of uh, alternative dispute resolution process. It should be noted that in federal court, for example, in the Northern District of California, they have their own requirements and that doesn't apply. They are, there is a, a, a alternative dispute resolution process and a hold on discovery anyway. Uh, there's also a provision in this law that uh, attempts to prevent stacking of multiple claims. So. Uh, some of you may have found that there may be an individual coming to your property, comes on 10 different occasions, then they seek uh, statutory uh, penalties or damages for each occasion, which that could result in it being $40,000 $40, in damages. Uh, what they did was in the, in the law, and this is probably one of the more si significant aspects of the change, is that it, it, the new law provides that in considering these multiple claims, the court may assess the reasonableness of the plaintiff's actions in light of, the, of his or her obligation to mitigate damages. And what that means is that if the individual could complain, could do something to correct the condition so it wouldn't occur on the, on the following visits, that's, and, the, and, the, and that individual did not complain or do anything, that can be used to show uh, that the actual, or I'm sorry, the statutory damages should be decreased. Uh, another change, too, uh, that's important for property owners and lessors to know is uh, after, for any lease agreement uh, after July 1, 2013, uh, that they need to um, make disclosures about whether there has been a cast in inspection, and if, they, if, as a result, the property meets the applicable uh, or met the standards as identified in the cast in inspection. Uh, one important point that I have for these CAST inspections is that you, if you're going to have a CAST inspection, there's, there are a dime a dozen, there are a number of individuals out there that hold themselves to be CAST inspectors. Some of them uh, are better than others or more qualified than others, and so it's important to, uh, to be careful in, 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 in whom you select uh, for this inspection. And um, it, if you are going to use a CAST inspector, uh, it's highly recommended that that individual be retained by counsel uh, so that there is a potential privilege um, depending on what the findings are because if that person comes on and finds that you're grossly out of compliance and those conditions aren't fixed, that could be used against the business to prove uh, entitlement to treble damages. Okay, so let's move on to, to preventive strategies. And um, there, it's really important for properties to assess um, the state of accessibility before there is a lawsuit. And there, and there are little things that can be done. Um, if you cannot correct all of the po possible con uh, conditions, you can focus on ones um, that are more likely, likely to lead to exposure. Um, but what we recommend is that un under retention by legal counsel, you hire some, uh, an access specialist to review uh, the areas that are accessible to the public 
for um, potential violation of access standards as they apply to mobility, visual, and hearing disabilities. Uh, again, by having this person retained by legal counsel, you have potential privilege that you can assert so that would not be discoverable in litigation. If, you, if, it's, if that person's just coming out on his or her own, uh, if there's litigation down the line, that, that might be something that you'd have to turn over, um, which could be problematic. Um, and again, if, if you don't have the resources to correct all of the violations, and it really would depend on the, the nature of the facility and the, the status of the uh, potential uh, items, you can correct the items that are most likely to trigger a lawsuit. And those are largely the ones I discussed earlier as common violations. The parking areas, anything you can see from the street is really important to correct because you'll have that drive-by plaintiff, will see something out of compliance, say, hey, let me go in, let me see what else I can find now. Uh, and then it's important to also review any policies or practices uh, because, again, with the issues with uh, path of travel, if you have uh, uh, items that can be moved around and cause the path of travel to no longer be accessible, it's important to have some sort of guideline that establishes what the requirements are and training of staff on this. And it's an employee handbook, it can be in a training manual, it doesn't have to be anything all that extensive, but something that addresses the core issues. Um, it is, it's also important to um, consider uh, at these access requirements when you are uh, obtaining a lease for a property if you don't own the property. Uh, if you're purchasing property, I found in many cases with clients where they have uh, where they have a property where they had just purchased it, they had no idea it was out of compliance, and they're, and they're determining that this is going to be extremely costly um, to uh, to fix these conditions. Um, and um, and if you have multiple locations, uh, it's more important to establish some cohesive company-wide practice, and it really depends on the size of the business. If you are national with many different establishments, uh, if you can bring someone on that can focus on these access issues, perhaps among other responsibilities, to develop some sort of plan and ensure consistency. And one, okay, now, now let's move to defense strategies for litigation. Uh, they, we have our do's and don'ts list, and the do is uh, when you do receive the complaint, um, one of the worst things you could do is just sit on it and defer hiring counsel, even after you hire counsel, and not really do anything to, to determine what the uh, issues are and then have protracted litigation that could, could be quite costly. What drives the litigation is the attorney's fees. Um, it's the tail wagging the horse or the, the dog, I guess. and. Uh, and what, what happens is the plaintiff's lawyers will um, either want a, a quick payout at, at the commencement of the lawsuit, or they will just delay the litigation, be unreasonable, uh, and take unreasonable stance to make it as costly as possible, and then seek to recover all of their attorney's fees. So early on, you want to hire attorneys who are experienced with access litigation and that know the plaintiff's lawyers and can advise you on what the possible options are for an early resolution or how to litigate the case if it's not feasible to solve the case early on. Um, and what's important is to immediately when you receive the complaint, hire counsel, uh, the account, under uh, engagement with the counsel, have an access expert, and that's one that you could use as an expert in the case, come out, inspect the property, identify the p possible violations, and then what you want to do is also look at any of your lease agreements, um, uh, management agreements, and determine if, whether there's any other parties that may be responsible for remediation of these items. Typically, the common areas are responsibility of the landlord. The interior items are the responsibility of the tenant. But it really will depend on the, on the lease agreement in that case or the management agreement um, in the case, for example, of a hotel. And, um, and then you may want to make a demand to that other entity um, for indemnification or shared responsibility, however it would be worked out. It could be a cross-claim in, in the lawsuit potentially, depending on the uh, degree of cooperation. And then you want to develop your defenses 
to the sighted barriers. Um, and it's what you can do is if you have an, a, an opposing counsel that you think is going to be reasonable, you can broach a possible settlement. You, you want to look at the cost of all these items. Uh, qualified counsel and access experts can advise you on what the cost can potentially be and give you a ballpark. And you might want to look at a strategy for then how to go back to the plaintiff's lawyer and get a concessions on certain items. If it's something that's not going to be too costly, you think it's something important that could result in further litigation, you might just want to correct it. If it's something that's extremely costly, um, you can look at uh, uh, negotiating that away potentially with opposing counsel. You also want to, um, again, this is what I was talking about earlier about eliminating barriers for which, uh, in this case, if there's no colorable defense, um, if it's something that you don't think you can negotiate away and obtain a concession on, and you have no colorable defense, it behooves the property to uh, just agree to that change. Uh, and to the extent that it's protracted and that you don't have an agreement from the other side and you're going to be litigating this, it's just going to increase the legal fees in the case. Um, you also want to consider uh, participating in early mediation uh, before the fees escalate. And so typically in these cases, you'll have some sort of meet and confer session among counsel to try to resolve issues. And then if that doesn't work, then go to mediation. To the extent you can do this early on and, and, and reduce the attorney's fees and avoid a whole bunch of discovery over issues that you think you can resolve anyways, it's much better, of course. Uh, if you have a challenging opposing counsel, you cannot reach agreement. Um, uh, in those situations, it's really important to document your settlement efforts. In California, those, that documentation is admissible uh, as to the determination of the reasonable attorney's fees. So a judge can say, listen, opposing counsel is just being patently unreasonable. Therefore, I'm going to reduce their, their attorney's fees that they rec can recover. That's really important in California litigation in particular. And then you can also, also make an offer of judgment, which is something in uh, a mechanism in court where you can make an offer and make that for uh, a set amount where you're willing to do this, you're willing to pay this, and if they can't meet or exceed that at, at trial, then they, uh, uh, potentially they, their, their attorney's fees could be reduced. Um, and then what's really important that, that um, many properties don't think of is that, uh, is that when you do this construction in response to a lawsuit, if you're going to make some changes, is to have someone monitor it. It doesn't have to necessarily be your counsel or an access expert an architect, someone who can just go through and make sure that the changes were done appropriately according to specifications. It's so often the case where there's an AD, ADA uh, specific upgrade where after that upgrade, the property is even further out of compliance or, or that the issues have not been remediated. Uh, some don'ts. Um, it's, it's really important not to delay conducting an, an inspection. Um, an investigation at the outset. Um, if you wait too long, it's just giving the other side more time to rack up attorney's fees. Uh, unlike other areas of civil rights laws, uh, under the access uh, laws, if they establish one violation, they're entitled to attorney's fees. Uh, so the big disadvantage here is they could establish a couple violations, have a number of frivolous claims, and they're still going to recover at least a portion of their attorney's fees. And so it's, 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 it's a huge problem for businesses trying to uh, resolve these cases as soon as they can upon receipt of the complaint and avoid the incurrence of attorney's fees. Don't want to litigate undisputed violations. That's another issue. Um, that's just going to result in, in additional attorney's fees that you'll be paying both um, to your attorney as well as, as the plaintiff's attorney's fees that are ultimately recoverable. Um, you do not want to th uh, settle a threatened claim without seeking legal advice. It's really important that any settlement agreement be crafted in a way that minimizes any additional exposure. Um, and lastly, and this is a very big one, is that you don't want to settle a lawsuit without considering the impact that this will have on your other properties. Uh, so if you have an attorney that is very active uh, filing access lawsuits and you settle on certain terms, that could set uh, a precedent in the mind of that attorney. Uh, to the extent that that 
uh, settlement is part of a public record, such as a consent decree, that's something that could also be argued to show that the employer is on notice of these certain conditions. Uh, now we're going to uh, turn it over if there's any questions. As I mentioned, this is yeah the, the webinar is being recorded, and we also will circulate the slides to everybody afterwards. Um, but happy to to remain on the on the line a little bit longer. Sorry for the technical problems in the beginning that make us run over. But Andrew and I are here, as you can tell. Andrew's expert in California law, and and Andrew and I do this work all around the country as well. So. Feel free to send us questions now, or uh, feel free to get in touch with us uh, if something comes up in the future and, and we can provide any assistance on these issues. But I thank you for participating in our webinar, and hopefully uh, you'll be able to participate in future webinars uh, as we proceed. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>